Charles Francis Adams. An undeveloped function. History is past politics, and politics are present history. Edward A. Freeman. Politics are vulgar when they are not liberalized by history, and history fades into mere literature when it loses sight of its relation to practical politics. Sir John Seeley. Here are aphorisms from two writers, both justly distinguished in the field of modern historical research. Sententious utterances, they would probably, like most sententious utterances, go to pieces to a greater or less extent under the test of severe analysis. They will, however, now serve me sufficiently well as texts. That politics should find no place at its meetings is, I believe, the unwritten law of this association, and, by politics, I refer to the discussion of those questions of public conduct and policy for the time being uppermost in the mind of the community. Taking into consideration the character and purpose of our body, and the broad basis on which its somewhat loose membership rests, the rule may be salutary. But there are not many general propositions not open to debate, and so I propose on this occasion to call this unwritten law of ours in question. While so doing, moreover, I shall distinctly impinge upon it. Let us come at once to the point. May it not be possible that the unwritten law, perhaps it would be better to speak of it as the tacit understanding, I have referred to, admits of limitations and exceptions both useful and desirable? Is it, after all, necessary, or even, from a point of large view, well considered? thus to exclude from the list of topics to be discussed at meetings of historical associations, and especially of this association, the problems at the time uppermost in man's thoughts. Do we not, indeed, by so doing abdicate a useful public function, surrender an educational office, practically admitting by our act that we cannot trust ourselves to discuss political issues in a scholarly and historical spirit? In one word, are not those composing a body of this sort under a species of obligation, in a community like ours, to contribute their share, from the point of view they occupy, to the better understanding of the questions in a active political debate? This proposition, as I have said, I now propose to discuss, and, in so doing, I shall, for purposes of illustration, draw freely on present practical politics using as object lessons the issues now, or very recently, agitating the minds of not a few of those composing this audience, indeed, I hope, of all. I start from a fundamental proposition. The American Historical Association, like all other associations, whether similar in character or not, either exists for a purpose, or it had better cease to be. That purpose is, presumably, to do the best and most effective work in its power in the historical field. I then further, and with much confidence, submit that the standard of American political discussion is not now so high as not to admit of elevation. On the contrary, while, comparatively speaking, it ranks well both in tone and conduct, yet its deficiencies are many and obvious. That, taken as a whole, it is of a lower grade now than formerly, I do not assert, though I do assert, and propose presently to show, that in recent years it has been markedly lower than it was in some periods of the past, and periods within my own recollection. That, however, it is not so high as it should be, that it is by no manner of means ideal, all will, I think, admit. If so, that admission suffices for present purposes. My next contention is perhaps more open to dispute. It is a favorite theory now with a certain class of philosophers, somewhat inclined to the happy-go-lucky school, that in all things every community gets about what it asks for, and is qualified to appreciate. In political discussion, as in railroad or hotel service, and in literature or religion, the supply, as respects both quality and quantity, responds with sufficient closeness to the demand. There is, however, good reason for thinking that, with the American community which today is, or at least with some sections and elements thereof, this at best specious theory does not at the present time hold true. Our recent political debates have, I submit, 
been conducted on a level distinctly below the intelligence of the constituency, the participants in the debate have not been equal to the occasion offered them. Evidence of this is found in the absence of response. I think I am justified in the assertion that no recent political utterance has produced a real echo, much less a reverberation, and it would not probably be rash to challenge an immediate reference to a single speech, or pointed expression even, which during the last presidential campaign, for instance, impressed itself on the public memory. That campaign, seen through the vista of a twelve-month, was, on the contrary, from beginning to end, with a single exception, creditable neither to the parties conducting it, nor to the audience to whose level it was presumably gauged. Recall, I pray you, its incidents, already almost forgotten. They come back, when revived by an effort of memory, with a remote, far away echo, as of mockery. In the first place, on neither side were the issues of 1900 clearly defined or well presented, indeed. The long indecision as to what should be accepted as the paramount issue was, not remotely, suggestive of a certain very memorable hunting of the snark. Ignoring the personal element which entered so largely into it, as it enters into all canvases, the favorite argument with one set of orators was the post ergo propter, as illustrated in the full dinner pale, which argument those of the other side met by fierce denunciation of department stores, and the manifestly pertinent inquiry, addressed to the general auditory, as to what they proposed to do with their sons. The fate in store for their daughters, it was gloomily intimated, would admit of little question, should the opposing candidate be chosen. So far as what is known as labor is concerned, one candidate posed as the prescriptive protector of American industry, while the other warmly declared himself in favor of the man against the dollar. The talk from there. Hustings under this head was irresistibly suggestive of the scene in Dickens's old curiosity shop. The adherents of both candidates stoutly maintained that Codlin was the workingman's friend, not short, short might be very well as far as he went, but the real friend was Codlin. But, apart from this, the one noticeable feature, possibly the single significant feature of the canvas, was that it distinctly deteriorated as it progressed. It was opened by Mr. Bryan, on the 8th of August, with a speech at Indianapolis which struck a lofty note promising a high level of discussion. That speech fairly startled the reflecting portion of the community. It seemed for the moment as if the party in power would be forced to reckon seriously with the opposition throughout a sustained debate. How completely this promise failed of realization is fresh in memory. No subsequent utterance on either side made any impression on the public mind. Mr. Bryan, using his audience as a sounding board seemed thereafter to bid continually down, and, finally, the contest degenerated into a mere trial of endurance between himself and the talking candidate of the other side, the telegraph day by day recording the number of speeches made by each. A less inspiring competition could hardly be imagined, and, as the papers in flaring, modern time headlines declared that Mr. Roosevelt had the previous day broken all records by making eighteen speeches. They went on gravely to announce that Mr. Bryan had arranged a program for the morrow under which he would see his opponent and go him to better, orating to a square score of distinct audiences between 10 a.m. and midnight. But was this all the occasion called for? Did our much vaunted American intelligence demand nothing better? Credat Judsus. Not for a moment do I believe it. To that canvas, then. I propose presently to return, using it as an object lesson. I shall seek to revive the memory of its issues, for already they are far advanced on the road to oblivion, and I shall contrast what I have described as actually occurring with what was easily possible, had that same debate been actively participated in by organizations such as this of ours, organizations whose representative spokesmen would have at least approached the discussion, not in a partisan but in a scientific spirit. For even active political issues, I contend, freed from the deflection always incident to party prejudice and personal feeling, may be viewed in the light of principle, precedent and experience. Perhaps, however, I can best illustrate what I have to say, 
enforce the lesson I would fain this evening teach, by approaching it through retrospect. So doing, also, if there is any skill in my treatment, cannot well be otherwise than interesting, for I shall deal with events almost all within the recollection of those yet in middle life. But while those events are sufficiently removed from us to admit of the Nessie's Sari perspective, having assumed their true proportions to what preceded and has followed, they have an advantage over the occurrences of a year ago, for the controversial embers of 1900 may still be glowing in 1901, though, I must say, to me the ashes seem white and cold and dead enough. Still, I do not propose to go back to any very remote period, and I shall confine myself to my own recollection, speaking of that only of which I know, and in which I took part. My review will begin with the year 1856, the year of my graduation, and that in which I cast my first vote, also one in which a president was chosen, James Buchanan being the successful candidate. Under the provisions of our constitution, a great national debate is preordained for every fourth year. The whole policy of the government is thus at fixed periods challenged and reviewed. Whether, as the country has expanded and its population multiplied, while the questions involved in material interests of ever-growing volume have become more complex and difficult of comprehension, this fixed Olympic period is wise, or, if wise, that assigned is not too short, are open questions. I think the period at any rate too short. Large bodies proverbially move slowly, and considerable stages of fixity are necessary to adjustment. In the case of so large and complex a body politic as the United States has now become, four years are manifestly insufficient for that purpose. Recent experience has shown such to be the case. But this is not now to be discussed. For our present purpose we must take things as they are and the fundamental law imposes on us a national political debate every fourth year, wholly irrespective of circumstance. As 1856 was one of the years thus in advance assigned, I have now taken part in no less than twelve presidential canvases. Approaching them in a spirit strictly historical, these I propose briefly to review. Yet it must be premised that each election does not represent a debate, not infrequently it is merely a stage in a debate. It was so in 1856, it has been so several times since. Indeed, since 1840, the famous log cabin and hard cider campaign of coon skin caps, and Tip Cano and Tyler, two, probably the, most humorous, not to say grotesque, episode in our whole national history, that in which the plane of discussion reached its lowest recorded level since 1840 there have been only six real debates, the average period of a debate being, therefore, ten years. These debates were, one, that over slavery, from 1844 to 1864, two, that over reconstruction, from 1868 to 1872, three, legal tenders, or fiat money, and resumption of specie payments were the issues in 1876 and 1880. 4. The issue of 1888 and 1892 was over protection and free trade. 5. The debate over bematism and the demonetization of silver occurred in 1896. And, finally, 6. Imperialism, as it is called, came to the front in 1900. Since 1856, therefore, the field of discussion has been wide and diversified, presenting several issues of great moment. Of necessity, also, the debates have assumed many and diverse aspects ethical, ethnological, legal, military, economical, financial, historical. The last named aspect is that which interests us. In every one of these debates, and it goes almost without saying, the historical aspect has been prominent, it is, indeed, the one aspect which is all pervasive. And this must be the case just so long as men, yielding respect to precedent, seek guidance from the experience of the past. My purpose is, briefly passing these debates in review, to measure the degree to which the trained historical element in the American community entered into them as an influencing factor. And to estimate the extent to which such an element might have entered into them, 
with results manifestly beneficial. I shall endeavor to show the great benefit, the elevating influence, which in all these debates, though far more in some than in others, would have been derived from the active participation therein of such an organization as this, an organization wholly free from party lines, but divided in opinion, which would approach the questions at issue from a point of view distinctly scholarly and scientific. In doing this, let it be always borne in mind that, in scholarship and in science also, unanimity is not to be expected, scarcely to be desired. In the study of history, as in religion and in science, schools differ. The record is voluminous and full of precedents from which very contradictory conclusions, all more or less plausible, may be drawn. In this field, as in others, the great desideratum is to have every side fully and vigorously presented, with a full assurance that the soundest conclusions will survive as being, here also, always the most fit. The first of these debates, that involving the slavery issue, is now far removed. We can pass upon it historically, for the young man who threw his maiden vote in 1860, when it came to its close, is now nearing his grand climacteric. Of all the debates in our national history that was the longest, the most elevated, the most momentous and the best sustained. It looms up in memory, it projects itself from history. As a whole, it was immensely creditable to the people, the community at large, for whose instruction it was conducted. It has left a literature of its own, economical, legal, moral, political, imaginative. In fiction it produced Uncle Thomas Cabin, still, if one can judge by the test of demand at the desks of our public libraries, one of the most popular books in the English tongue. In the law, it rose to the height of the Dred Scott decision, and, while the rulings in that case laid down have since been reversed, it will not be denied that the discussion of constitutional principles involved, whether at the bar, in the halls of legislatures, in the columns of the press or on the rostrum, was intelligent, of an order extraordinarily high, and of a very sustained interest. It was to the utmost degree educational. So far as their historical aspect of that great debate is concerned, two things are to be specially noted. In the first place, the moral and economical aspects predominated, and, in the second place, what may be called the historical element as an influencing factor was then in its infancy. Neither in this country nor in Europe had that factor been organized, as it now is. The slavery debate was so long and intense that all the forces then existing were drawn into it. The pulpit, for instance, participated actively. The physiologist was much concerned over ethnological problems, trying to decide whether the African was a human being or an animal, and, if the former, was he of the family of Cain. Thus, all contributed to the discussion, and yet I am unable to point out any distinctly historical contribution of a high order, though, on both sides, the issue was discussed historically with intelligence and research. Especially was this the case in the arguments made before the courts and in the scriptural dissertations, while, on the political side, the speeches of Seward and Sumner, of Jefferson, Davis and A. H. Stevens, leave little to be desired. The climax was, perhaps, reached in the memorable joint debate between Lincoln and Douglas, of which it is not too much to say the country was the auditory. The whole constituted a fit prologue to the great tragedy which ensued. Beginning, in its closing stage, in January, 1854, when the measure repealing the Missouri Compromise of 1820 was introduced into the Senate of the United States, and closing in December, 1860, with the passage of its Ordinance of Secession by South Carolina, this debate was continuous for seven years, covering two presidential elections, those of 1856 and 1860. So far as I know, it was sui generis, for it would, I fancy, be useless to look for anything with which to institute a comparison, except in the history of Great Britain. Even there, the discussion which preceded the passage of the CAF 4M Bill of 1832, or that which led up to the repeal of the Corn Laws in 1846, or, finally, 
the Irish Home Rule agitation between 1871 and 1893, one and all sink into insignificance beside it. Of the great slavery debate it may then in fine be said that, while the study of history and the lessons to be deduced from history contributed not much to it, it made history, and on history has left a permanent mark. Of the canvas of 1864, from our point of view little need be said. There was in it no field fruitful for the historical investigator, the issue then presented to the people being of a character altogether exceptional. The result depended less on arguments than on the outcome of operations in the field. There was, I presume, during August and September of that year, a wordy debate, but the people were too intent on Sherman as he circumvented Atlanta, and on Sheridan as he sent early whirling up the valley of the Shenandoah, to give much ear to it. Had this association then been in existence, and devoted all its energies to elucidating the questions at issue, I cannot pretend to think it would perceptibly have affected the result. Nor was it greatly otherwise in the canvas of 1868. The country was then stirred to its very depths over the questions growing out of the war. The shattered union was to be reconstructed. The slave system was to be eradicated. These were great political problems, problems as pressing as they were momentous. For their proper solution it was above all else necessary that they should be approached in a calm, scholarly spirit, observant of the teachings of history. Never was there a greater occasion, rarely has one been so completely lost. The assassination of Lincoln silenced reason, and to reason, and to reason only, does history make its appeal. The unfortunate personality of Andrew Johnson now intruded itself, and, almost at once, what should have been a calm debate degenerated into a furious wrangle. Looking back over the canvas of 1868, and accepting General Grant's singularly felicitous closing of his brief letter of acceptance, let us have peace. I think it would be difficult for anyone to recall a single utterance of that campaign which produced any lasting impression. The name even of the candidate nominated in opposition to Grant is not readily recalled. In that canvas, as in the preceding one, I should say there was no room for the economist, the philosopher, or the historian. The country had, for the time being, cut loose from both principle and precedent. The debate over Reconstruction, begun in 1865, did not wear itself out until 1876. In no respect will it bear comparison with that debate over slavery which preceded it. Sufficiently momentous, it was less sustained, less thorough, far less judicial. Towards its close, moreover, as the country wearied, it was gravely complicated by a new issue, for, in 1867, began that currency discussion, destined to last in its various phases through the lifetime of a generation. It thereafter entered, in greater or less degree, into no less than nine consecutive presidential elections, two of which, those of 1876 and 1896, actually turned upon it. The currency debate presented three distinct phases, first, the proposition, broached in 1867, known as the Greenback Theory, under which the interest-bearing bonds of the United States, issued during the rebellion were to be paid at maturity in United States legal tender notes, bearing no interest at all. This somewhat amazing proposition was speedily disposed of, for, early in 1869, an act was passed declaring the bonds payable in coin. But, as was sure to be the case, the so-called fiat money delusion had obtained a firm lodgment in the minds of a large part of the community, and to drive it out was the work of time. It assumed, too, all sorts of aspects. Dispelled in one form, it reappeared in another. When, for instance, the Act of 1869 settled the question as respects the redemption of the bonds, the financial crisis of 1873 reopened it by creating an almost irresistible popular demand for a govern. Meant paper currency as a permanent substitute for specie. Finally, when, seven years later, this issue was put to rest by a return to specie payments, the overproduction of silver, as compared with gold, 
already foreshadowed the rise of one of the most serious and far-reaching questions which has perplexed modern times. Thus, as the ethical and legal issues, which were the staples of public discussion from 1844 to 1872, were disposed of, or by degrees settled themselves, a series of monetary questions arose, destined, even if at times in a somewhat languid way, to occupy public attention through thirty years. Yet there is, in connection with the canvases of 1876, 1880 and 1884, a suggestive reflection, which, if laid properly to heart, ought to bear fruit in future quadrennials. It is not now easy for those who took part, perhaps an eager and interested part, in those elections, to name offhand the opposing candidates, much less to state the issues upon which the country then divided. It is very suggestive how much less momentous the average presidential choice becomes, the further we get away from it. Finally, we come to realize that, in world development, and even in national life, it would have been very much the same whichever candidate was chosen. Perhaps, after all, this lesson is that of not least historical value to be deduced from the study of well-nigh forgotten presidential campaigns. It is difficult to say what the dividing issue of 1876 really was. The country was then slowly recovering from the business prostration which followed the collapse of 1873. The issues involved in reconstruction, if not disposed of, were clearly worn out. The country, weary of them, would not respond, turning impatiently from further discussion. Those issues might now settle themselves, or go unsettled and, though that conclusion was reached thirty years ago, they are not settled yet. The living debate was over material questions, the cause of the prolonged boosiness depression, and the remedy for it. The favorite specific was, at first, a recourse to paper money, the government printing press was to set it in motion, and, even hard money Democrats of the Jacksonian school united with radical Republicans of the Reconstruction period in guaranteeing a resultant prosperity. Again, the teachings of history were ignored. What, it was contemptuously exclaimed in the Senate, do we care for abroad? From this calamity the V country had been saved by the veto of President Grant in 1874, and, the following year. An act was passed looking to the resumption of specie payments on the 1st of January, 1879. Seventeen years of suspension were then to close. Over this measure, the parties nominally joined issue in 1876. The Republicans, nominating Governor Hayes of Ohio, demanded the fulfillment of the promise. The Democrats, nominating Governor Tilden of New York, insisted on the repeal of the law. Yet it was well understood that the candidate of the democracy favored the policy of which the law in debate was the concrete expression. The contest was thus in reality one between the ins and the outs. We all remember how it resulted, and the terrible strain to which our machinery of government was in consequence subjected. In the wrangle which ensued, the material and business interests of the country recouper. Aided in a natural way just as had repeatedly been the case before, and more than once since, and the United States then entered on a new era of increased prosperity. This brought the paper money debate to a close. The issues presented had, in the course of events, settled themselves. But, not the less for that, in the canvas of 1876 a field of great political usefulness was opened up to the historical investigator, a field which, I submit, he failed adequately to develop. A public duty was left unperformed. It was in connection with what John Stuart Mill has in one of his dissertations and discus sons happily denominated the currency juggle. From time immemorial, to tamper with the established measures of value has been the constant practice of men of restless and unstable mind, honest or dishonest, whether rulers or aspirants to rule. History is replete with instances. To cite them was the function of the historical investigator, to marshal them, and bring them to bear on the sophistries of the day, was the business of the politician. A professorial discussion in a meeting of such an organization as this would then have been much to the point, and yet, curiously enough, 
a new historical precedent was about to be worked out. That was then to be done which had never been done before, a country which had gone to the length the United States had gone in the direction of fiat money, two-thirds of the way to repudiation, was actually to retrace its steps, and resume payments in specie at the former standards of value. History would have been searched in vain for a parallel experience. The administration of President Hayes was Curie. Ousley Epochal. During it the so-called carpetbag governments disappeared from the southern states, the country resumed payments in specie, and, on 28 February, 1878, Congress passed, over the veto of the President, an act renewing the coinage of silver dollars, the stoppage of which, five years before constituted what was destined thereafter to be referred to as the crime of 1873. This issue, however, matured slowly. Public men, having recourse to palliatives, temporized with it, and, through four presidential elections it lay dormant, except in so far as parties pledged themselves to action calculated, in the well-nigh idiotic formula of politicians, to do something for silver. The canvases of 1880 and 1884 are, therefore, devoid of historical interest. The first turned largely on the tariff, and yet, curiously enough, the single utterance in that debate which has left a mark on the public memory was the wonderful dictum of General Hancock, the candidate of the defeated opposition, that the tariff was a local issue, which, a number of years before, had excited a good deal of interest in his native state of Pennsylvania. The gallant and picturesque soldier, metamorphosed into a political leader Projek Vice, simply harked back to the log cabin and coon skin campaign of 1840, when, a youth of sixteen, he was on his way to West Point. Nor is the recollection of the debate of 1884 much more inspiring. It was a lively contest enough, under Grover Cleveland and James G. Blaine as opposing candidates, a struggle between the outs to get in and the inns not to go out. But a single formula connected with it comes echoing down the quarry. Doors of time, the alliterative rum, Romanism, and rebellion of the unfortunate Burchard. An interlude in the succession of great national debates, the canvas of 1884 called for no application of the lay sons of history. That of 1888, presenting at last an issue, rose to the dignity of debate. In his annual message of the previous December, the President, in disregard of all precedent, had confined his attention not only to the tariff, but to a single feature in the tariff, the duty on wool. In so doing he had, as the well understood candidate of his party for re-election, flung down the gauntlet, for, only three years before, the Republican Party, in its quadrennial declaration of articles of cardinal political faith had laid heavy emphasis on the importance of sheep industry, and the danger threatening its future prosperity. The opposition had thus pledged itself to do something for wool, as well as for silver, and the president now struck at wool as the tariff arch keystone. But, while in this debate the economist came to the front, there was no pronounced call and, indeed, small opportunity for the historian. The silver issue was in abeyance. The pension list and civil service were not calculated to incite to investigation, nor had history much to say on either topic. As to the sheep industry, now so much in evidence, the British woolsack might afford a text suggestive of curious learning in connection with England's once greatest staple, how, for instance, as a protective measure, it was by one parliament solemnly ordained that the dead should be buried in woollens but it will readily be admitted that the historic spirit does not kindle over tariff schedules. There. Lessons of experience to be drawn from revenue tables appeal rather to the school of Adam Smith than to the disciples of Gibbon. Returning to the review of our national debates, in that of 1892 the shadow of coming events was plainly perceptible. The tariff issue had now lost its old significance for the infant industries had developed into trade and legislation compelling trusts. These were suggestive of new and, as yet, inchoate problems, but to them the constituency was not yet prepared intelligently to address itself. Populism was rife, with its crude and restless theories, a crisis in the history of the precious metals was clearly impending, 
with the outcome in doubt, indiscriminate and unprecedented pension giving had reduced an overflowing exchequer to the verge of bankruptcy. The debate of 1,892 acres accordingly dropped back to the politicians' level, that of 1876, 1880 and 1884. In it there was nothing of any educational value, nothing that history will dwell upon. The inns pointed with pride. The outs sternly arraigned the inns, while the student, whether of economics or history, there found small place and a listless audience. The memory of the canvas which resulted in the second administration of Cleveland is quite obliterated by the issues, altogether unexpected, which the ensuing years precipitated. Of quite another character were the two canvases of 1896 and 1900. Still fresh in memory, the echoes of these have indeed not yet ceased to reverberate, and I assert without hesitation that, not since 1856 and 1860, has this people passed through two such wholesome and educational experiences. In 1896 and in 1900, as in the debates of forty years previous, there was a place, and a large place, for the student, whether investigator or philosopher. Great problems, problems of law, of economics and ethics, problems involving peace and war, and the course of development in the oldest as in the newest civilizations, had to be discussed, on the way to a solution. That the prolonged debate running through those eight years was at all equal to the occasion, I do not think can be claimed. Even his most ardent admirers will hardly claim that Mr. Bryan in 1896 and 1900 rose to the level reached by Lincoln forty years before, nor do the utterances of Mr. Roosevelt, Mr. Depew, or Mr. Hannah air well a comparison with those of Seward, Trumbull and Sumner. And that this momentous, many-sided debate failed to rise to the proper height was due, I now unhesitatingly submit, to the predominance in it of the political U-boss and the absence from it of the scholar. In it, those belonging to this association, and to other associations similar in character to this, did not play their proper part, they proved themselves unequal to the occasion. Indeed, in the whole wordy canvas of 1896, I now recall but two instances of the professor or philosopher distinctively taking the floor, but both of those were memorable. They imparted an elevation of tone to discuss scion, immediately and distinctly perceptible, in the press and on the platform. I refer to the single utterance of Karl Schurz, before a small audience at Kai Cargo, on the 5th of September, and to the subsequent publications of President Andrew D. White, in which, from his library at Ithaca, he drew freely on the stores of historical experience in crushing refutation of demagogical campaign sophistry. Amid the petulant chat, tearing of the political magpies, it was refreshing to hear those clear-cut, incisive utterances, calm, thoughtful, well-reasoned. I have been told that in its various forms of republication, no less than five millions, and some authorities say ten millions, of copies of that Chicago speech of Mr. Schkertz were then put in circulation. It was indeed a masterly production, a production in which a high keynote was struck, and sustained. But the suggestive and extremely encouraging fact in connection with it was the response it elicited. Delivering himself at the highest level to which he could attain, Mr. Schkertz was only on a level with his audience. To the political optimist that fact spoke volumes, it revealed infinite possibilities. Twelve presidential canvases and six great national debates have thus been passed in rapid review. It is as if, in the earlier history of the country, we had run the gamut from Washington to Van Buren. Taken as a whole, viewed in gross and perspective, the retrospect leaves much to be desired. That the debates held in Ireland and France during the same time have been on a distinctly lower level, I at once concede. Those held in Great Britain and Germany have not been on a higher. Yet ours have at best been only relatively educational, as a rule extremely partisan, they have been personal, often scurrilous, and more frequently still, I regret greatly to find myself compelled to say, intentionally deceptive. A singular feature in them has been the noticeable fact that where, from time to time, the clergy have intervened, 
their so doing has not tended to elevate. They have been conspicuous neither for moderation nor for charity. While they actually seemed to revel in their ignorance of the teachings of the past. One fact in the review is, however, salient. With the exception of the first, that of 1856-60, not one of the debates reviewed has left an utterance which, were it to die from human memory, would by posterity be accounted a loss. This, I am aware, is a sweeping allegation, in itself almost an indictment. Yet, with some confidence, I challenge a denial. Those here are not, as a rule, in their first youth, and they have all of them been more or less students of history. Let each pass in rapid mental review the presidential canvases in which he has in any degree participated, and endeavor to recall a single utterance which has stood the test of time, as marking a distinct addition to mankind's intellectual belongings, the classics of the race. It has been at best a babel of the commonplace. I do not believe one utterance can be named for which a life of ten years will be predicted. Such record undeniably admits of improvement. Two questions, then, naturally suggest themselves, to what has this shortcoming been due, dash wherein lies the remedy for it? The shortcoming, I submit, is in greatest part due to the fact that the work of discussion has been left almost wholly to the journalist and the politician, the professional journalist and the professional politician. And in the case of both, there has in this country, during the last forty years, been, so far as grasp of principle is concerned, a marked tendency to deterioration. Nor, I fancy, is the cause of this far to seek. It is found in the growth, increased complexity, and irresistible power of organization as opposed to individuality, in the parlance of the day, it is the all potency of the machine over the man, equally noticeable whether by that word, machine, we refer to the political organization or to the newspaper. Let the last be considered first. The Daily Journal. The newspaper, is indisputably the one far-reaching organ of popular political education. Through its columns, as a medium, the teachings of those who think on all subjects, educational, religious, moral, political, percolate slowly, and, as a rule, in a very diluted form, finding thus at last lodgment and acceptance in the public thought. They are slowly assimilated. But the newspaper of today is altogether the product of the last century, almost of the last half of the century. Practically brought into being by James Gordon Bennett and Horace Greeley during the forties, it then, and finally thirty years after, represented an editorial individuality, of which Greeley was the highest type. From 1841 to 1872, Horace Greeley was the New York Tribune, and the New York Tribune during those years was the greatest educational factor, economically and morally, this country has ever known. The protective tariff is its monument, Sir Perennius. The Tribune still exists, but the Tribune of today is no longer the organ of one man. A news medium, owned by a syndicate, its utterance is shaped by a business management, an editorial or a council, are turned out by the yard by salaried ready writers, quill drivers of fortune, whose necessary fate it is always to strive to reduce superficiality to a system. By journalism, a modern writer of much acumen says, is to be understood, I suppose, writing for pay on matters of which you are ignorant, one. And, as an evolution, the modern newspaper is the necessary outcome of existing conditions. A financial combination controls a most intricate, costly and influential machine. Since 1872 the intense, widely pervasive personality of Horace Greeley has given place to the ordered and stereotyped utterances of the Tribune's editorial staff. Mutatis mutandis, it is the same in politics. As Tennyson wrote two generations ago, the individual with us, and the world is more and more. The intricacy of modern political life, the magnitude of interests and expenditure, the cohesive power of plunder, the number of those who make of political life a breadwinning trade, the size of the constituency. All these concurring conditions have resulted in a state of affairs in which the machine, 
of necessity, predominates. Among the qualities which go to constitute that natural aptitude calculated to win success in public life, to secure office and retention in office. Grasp of principle, or a philosophical or statesmanlike turn of mind, no longer find a place. What is needed is the faculty of managing men, combining interests, or conforming to tendencies. In a word, what is vulgarly but most expressively known as the boss is, in our American public life, the logical outcome of the syndicate and machine principle applied to existing political conditions. The boss is, in fact, to America what the imperator was to Rome. It is the master mechanic with his hand on the lever, but, as the machine responds to his touch, the individual is eliminated. This tendency of the day, few, I think, deny. Indeed, all must recognize the growth of combination. It can be studied everywhere, save in the highest forms of art and thought. Syndicates cannot turn out great poems, or noble statues, or attain to a deep insight. In letters, their power is confined to the profuse manufacture of printed matter, dictionaries, blue books, cooperative histories, and the like. But we have now to do only with the political life and the higher educational forces there in action, or possible to bring into action in any emergency, and the increased power of the machine in that field, I take to be one of the indications of the time, not less unmistakable than significant. Machine work always has a degenerating tendency. The more powerful the machine, the more it inclines to self-aggrandization and the perpetuation of abuse. A perfect machine is as nearly soulless as may be. Such a machine was the Church of Rome in the days of Voltaire and the Gala's tragedy, such a machine is the French army now, as exemplified in the Dreyfus affair, and the experience therein of Zola. The tendency from the individual towards the machine, in American journalism and public life, cannot be denied. It distinctly does not promote a loftier, a more liberal and scholarly tone of discussion, on the contrary, it works always in the opposite way. This being so, in what direction may we look for the corrective agency? In a body politic, so full of vitality, so instinct with life, as that of ours, each evil works its own cure. The remedial action is apt to reveal itself in unexpected quarters, and in shapes not at once recognized, but, unless the body politic is decadent, it is as sure to assert itself as it is in the case of disease in a physical organization not moribund that those who philosophize and prescribe in this and kindred cases generally reach wrong conclusions is quite indisputable, it is safe, indeed, to say that they do so in more than nine cases out of ten. As Mr. Disraeli long since sagely observed, it is the unexpected which is apt to occur. In the present case I wish, therefore, in advance, to acknowledge that I am probably quite wide of the mark in both my diagnosis of the disease and my forecast of the remedy. That remedy, moreover, when it comes, will, I am confident, not be in the nature of some ingenious discovery, an invention which might admit of letters patent. On the contrary, it will be an evolution, the natural development of internal healing force asserting itself to meet a pathological condition. Not posing here, therefore, as a physician prescribing a sure cure of his own devising, but as an observer of conditions and symptoms, I propose to point out, so far as my observation and insight enable me so to do, the indications of a self-curative process already asserting itself. The source of trouble being located in the tendency to excessive organization, it would seem natural that the counteracting agency should be looked for in an exactly opposite direction, that is, in the increased efficacy of individualism. Of this, I submit, it is not necessary to go far in search of indications. Take, for instance, the examples already referred to, of Mr. Schertz and President White, in the canvas of 1896, and suppose, for a moment, efforts such as theirs then were, made more effective as resulting from the organized action of an association like this. Our platform at once becomes a rostrum, and a rostrum from which a speaker of reputation and character is ensured a wide hearing. His audience, too, 
is present to listen and repeat. From such a rostrum, the observer, the professor, the student, be it of economy, of history, or of philosophy, might readily be brought into immediate contact with the issues of the day. So bringing him is but a step. He would appear, also, in his proper character and place, the scholar having his say in politics, but always as a scholar, not as an office holder, nor an aspirant for office. His appeal would be to intelligence and judgment, not to passion or self-interest, or even to patriotism. The elements are all there, the question is only as to a method of effective concentration. It must, I submit, be sought for here on the floor of the academy, and not in the confusion of the caucus. A due sense of political proportion might then become possible. Heretofore, the view customarily taken has been too narrow and too close. The continuity of movement has been ignored, and the true relation of things intentionally distorted. The effort has uniformly been to give each contest, in so far as possible, a crucial aspect. All has been made to depend on that particular cast of the dice. The future of the race, one would suppose, rests on the outcome of some struggle, in which, in fact, those immediately participating are alone concerned. The retrospect I have just invited you to tells a very different story. Sixteen presidential elections, and only six national debates in sixty years. The issues, moreover, involved in those debates have in most cases been settled, not on the hustings or in Congress, but by the course of events, the logic of the philosopher, the scientist, or the economist. Illustrations of this, also, are not far to seek. In the journal of the day on which I am writing these words, I find, for instance, a confession of faith by a United States senator, in which he indulges in this, for a politician, refreshing form of speech. In 1896, we had a campaign on the money question. Everything was depressed, idleness, discontent, distrust, and misery, everywhere. We were told that the salvation of the country depended upon the free coinage of silver. I believed then, and I believe now, that theoretically we were right, but new and unforeseen forces came into play, and I have enough sense to recognize the fact that the restoration of confidence about which Mr. Cleveland talked, and about which I did not know enough at the time to understand, the discovery of gold in the Klondike, the influx of money seeking investment from abroad, and the increase of banking facilities, have, for the time being at least, settled the money question, and nobody but a fool would make a for free silver speech now. What did the politicians have to do with the restoration of confidence? It was the work of time, and of the producing and business community. What did they have to do with the discoveries in the Klondike? On with the cyanide treatment of refractory ores? On with the increase of capital? seeking employment itself and giving employment to labor? Throughout that long and momentous debate, I submit, so far as the result was concerned and the record shows, our statesmen and journalists remind us only of Burke's famous metaphor of the dozen grasshoppers making the field ring with their importunate chink, while thousands of great cattle, chewing the cud, silently repose under the shadow of the British oak. I, Looking back over the whole period that is gone since that. April day 36 years ago, when Grant and Lee, at Appomattox, brought the conflict in the field to a close, and speaking in perfect moderation, I cannot point to one single beneficial result of a positive char actor which can properly be classed as political. As a species of safety valve, political debate has, I admit, been of infinite service. Unending and mostly idle in character, it has prevented ill-considered and precipitate action, and given natural influences time in which to work out their results. Beyond this, what can be put to its credit? Take the debates in their order. The political congressional reconstruction of the slaveholding and rebellious South has certainly failed to bear the test of time. What was then done has since been undone, and the section concerned is even now groping its way, painfully, and with no excess of intelligence and humanity, towards a more practical and better considered solution. Thanks to a providential veto, 
the great currency debate ended in an absolutely do-nothing policy. Of the tariff debate I will not speak. Stretching through a whole century, it once brought the country to the verge of civil war, and its history is read in a vast literature of its own, a veritable Serbonian bog of sophistry, saturated with bad rhetoric. The practical outcome, as studied in our last general tariff revision, has not been deemed specially creditable to American political disinterestedness or scientific fiscal thought. Our pension list is, indeed, a monument, but scarcely of public liberality judiciously exercised. Finally, the advocates of free silver coinage, having erased from the statute book that Sherman bill which they themselves had inscribed there, confess that a fool only would be guilty of a silver speech now. Congress has all along been but a clumsy recording marchine of conclusions worked out in the laboratory and machine shop, and yet the idea is still deeply seated in the minds of men, otherwise intelligent, that, to effect political results, it is necessary to hold office, or at least to be a politician, and to be heard from the hustings. Is not the exact reverse more truly the case? The situation may not be, indeed it certainly is not, as it should be, it may be, I hold that it is, unfortunate that the scholar and investigator are finding themselves more and more excluded from public life by the professional with an aptitude for the machine, but the result is nonetheless patent. On all issues of real moment, issues affecting anything more than a division of the spoils, or the concession of some privilege of exaction from the community, it is the student, the man of affairs and the scientist who, today, in last resort, closes debate and shapes public policy. His. The last word. How to organize and develop his means of influence is the question. Here is what should strike, could one handle it cunningly, help the axe, give it a helve. So far as their historian is concerned, this association is, I submit, the helve to the axe. Of this the presidential election which closed just a year ago affords an apt illustration, ready at hand. No better could be asked for. What might then well have been? The American Historical Association, as I have already said, is composed of those who have felt a call for the investigation and treatment of historical problems. Its members, largely instructors. In our advanced education, feel that keen interest in the issues of the day, natural and proper in all good citizens, irrespective of calling. They want to contribute their share to discussion, and, in that way, to influence results, so far as in them lies. From every conceivable point of view it is most desirable that they should have facilities for so doing. I hold, therefore, that, in the last presidential canvas, a special meeting of this association, called to discuss the issues then pending, might well have tended to the better general and popular comprehension of those issues, and to the elevation of that debate. Conducted on academic principles, and looking to no formal expression of results in any enunciated platform of principles, such a gathering would have exercised an influence, as perceptible as beneficial, in lifting the discussion up into the domain of philosophy and research. It would have brought to bear the lessons of the past on the questions of the day. In any event, it would certainly not have descended to that contemptible post ergo propter formula, which, on the one side or the other, has in every presidential canvas been the main staple of argument. What were the issues of the last presidential canvas? On what questions did its debate turn? Three in number, they were, I think, singularly inviting to those historically minded. To the reflecting man the matter first in importance was what is known as imperialism, dash, the problem forced upon our consideration by the outcome of the war with Spain. Next I should place the questions of public policy involved in the rapid agglomerations of capital, popularly denominated trusts. Finally, the silver issue still lingered at the front, a legacy from the canvas of four years previous. The debate of 1900 is a thing of the past. Each of those issues can now be discussed, as it might well then have been discussed, in the pure historical spirit. Let us take them up in their inverse order. Historically speaking, 
I hold there were two distinct sides to the silver question, and, moreover, on the face of the record, the advocates of bematism, as it was called, had in 1896 the weight of the argument wholly in their favor. In his very suggestive work entitled Democracy and Liberty, Mr. Lecky referred to the discovery of America as producing, among other far-reaching effects, one which he considers most momentous of all. To quote his words, the produce of the American mines created, in the most extreme form ever known in Europe, the change which beyond all others affects most deeply and universally the material well-being of man, it revolutionized the value of the precious metals, and, in consequence, the price of all articles, the effects of all contracts, the burden of all debts. This was during the 16th century, the years following the great event of 1492. Again, the world went through a similar experience within our own memories, in consequence of the California and Australia gold finds, between 1848 and 1852. These revolutions were due to natural causes, and came about gradually. They were also of a stimulating character. From the beginning of modern commercial times, however, to the close of the last century, the exchanges of all civilized communities had been based on the precious metals, and silver had been quite as much as gold a precious metal for monetary purposes. Shortly after 1870 the policy of demonetizing silver was entered upon, and, in 1873, the United States gave in its adhesion to that policy. Thereafter, in the great system of international exchanges, silver ceased to be counted a part of that specie reserve on which drafts were made. Thenceforth, the drain, as among the financial centers, was to be on gold alone. In the whole history of man, no precedent for such a step was to be found. So far as the United States was concerned, the basis on which its complex and delicate financial fabric rested was weakened by one half and the cheaper and more accessible metal, that to which the debtor would naturally have recourse in discharge of his obligations, was made unavailable. It could further be demonstrated that, without a complete readjustment of currencies and values, the world's accumulated stock and annual production of gold could not, as a monetary basis, be made to suffice for its needs. A continually recurring contest for gold among the great financial centers was inevitable. A change which, in the language of Lecky, beyond all others affects most deeply and universally the material well-being of man, had been unwittingly challenged. The only question was, would the unexpected occur? Then, if it did occur, what might be anticipated? Such was the silver issue, as it presented itself in 1896. On the facts, the weight of argument was clearly with the advocates of the continued use of silver. Four years later, in 1900, the unexpected had occurred. As then resumed, the debate was replete with interest. The lessons of 1492 and 1848 a day. Direct bearing on the present, and, in the light by them shed, the outcome could be forecast almost with certainty but it was a world question. Japan, China, Hindostan entered into the problem, in which also both Americas were factors. It was a theme to inspire Burke, stretching back, as it did, from this latter day light to the middle age darkness, and involving the whole circling globe. Rarely has any subject called for more intelligent and comprehensive investigation, rarely has one been more confused and befogged by a denser misinformation. The discoverer and scientist, moving hand in hand, had, during the remission of the debate, been getting in their work, and, under the magic touch of their silent influence, the world's gold production rose by leaps and bounds. Less than 10 millions of ounces in 1896, in 1899 it had nearly touched 15 millions, and, in money value. It alone then exceeded the combined value of the gold and silver production of the earlier period. What did this signify? History was only repeating itself. The experiences of the first half of the 16th century and the middle decennaries of the 19th century were to be emphasized on the threshold of the 20th. 
So much for the silver question and its possible treatment. In the discussion of 1900, the last word in the debate of 1896 remained to be uttered. A page in history, both memorable and instructive, was to be turned. Next trusts, those vast aggregations of capital in the hands of private combinations, constituting practical monopolies of whole branches of industry, and of commodities necessary to man. Was the world to be subject to taxation at the will of a moneyed syndicate? The debate of a year ago over this issue, if debate it may be called, is still very recent. In it the lessons of history were effectually ignored, and yet, if applied, they would have been sufficiently suggestive. The historian was as conspicuous for his absence as the demagogue was in evidence. The cry was against monopoly and the monopolist, a cry which, as it has been ringing through all recorded times, suggests for the historical investigator a wide and fruitful field. Curiously enough, the first lesson to be derived from labor in that field is a paradox. Practically, so far as extortion is concerned, there is almost nothing in common between the old-time monopoly and the modern trust. Of examples of the first, the record is monotonously full. Mere agents of the government, sometimes the favorites of the crown, the whole machinery of the state has time out of mind been put at the service of monopolists to enable them to exact tribute from all. To the student of English history the names and misdeeds of Sir Francis Michel and Sir Giles Mompesson at once suggest themselves, while others, more familiar with the drama, recall Sir Giles' overreach, or that powerful scene in Nui Bias in which the Spanish courtiers wrangled together, coming almost to blows, over a partition among themselves of the right to extort. The old system still survives. For example, in France today the manufacture and sale of salt is a government monopoly. A prime necessity of life, no person not specially authorized may engage in the production of salt, or import it into France. If a peasant woman, living on the sea coast of Brittany or Nor. Mandy, endeavors to procure salt for her family by the slow process of evaporating a pailful of sea water in the sun, she is engaged in an illicit trade and becomes amenable to law. Her salt will certainly, if found, be confiscate. So of improved pocket matches. In France, their manufacture is a government revenue monopoly. They are notoriously bad. Those made and sold in Great Britain are, on the contrary, noted for excellence. If, however, passing from England to France, a box of British matches is found in the pocket of a traveller, it is taken from him and the contents are destroyed at once, indeed, he is fortunate if he escapes the payment of a fine. This is monopoly, the whole strength of a government being put forth to exact an artificial profit on the sale of a commodity in general use. There is a historical literature pertaining to the subject, a lamentation, and an ancient tale of wrong. Into that literature I do not propose to enter. It is familiar, and fully explains the deadly effect of the word monopoly today, or of the opprobrious term monopolist, when flung as a missile from the hustings. It is an epithet suggestive of a branding iron, and of the scars of Burns, the recollection of which is embedded in the popular mind. The curious feature in the present discussion, that which in the thought of the student of things as opposed to words imparts a special interest to it, is that, while the trust, or vast aggregation of capital and machinery of production in the hands of individuals designed to the end that competition may be brought under control, is in fact the modern form of monopoly, it is in its methods and results the direct opposite of the old-time monopoly, for, whereas the purpose and practice of that was to extort from all purchasers an artificial price for an inferior article through the suppression of competitors, the first law of its existence for the modern trust is, through economize and magnitude of production, to supply to all buyers a better article at a price so low that other producers are driven from the market. The ground of popular complaint against the trust is, not that it exacts an inordinate profit on what it sells, but that it sells so low that the small manufacturer or merchant is deprived of his trade. This distinction, with a difference, 
explains that once the wholly futile character of the politicians outcry against trusts, it is easy, for instance, to denounce from the platform the magnates of the Sugar Trust to a sympathizing audience, and yet not one human being in that audience, his sympathies to the contrary notwithstanding, will the next morning pay a fraction of a cent more per pound for his sugar, that, by so doing, he may help to keep alive some struggling manufacturer, who advertises that his product does not bear the trust stamp. As to the outcome of conflicts of this character, his Tory is a monotony. They can have but one result, an industrial readjustment. A single familiar illustration will suffice. Anyone who chooses to turn back to it can read the story of the long conflict between the spinning wheel and the loom. For Merley, and not so very far back, the distaff and spinning wheel were to be seen in every house, homespun was the common wear. Today, the average man or woman has never seen a distaff, nor heard the hum of a spinning wheel. Ceasing long since to be a com. Modity, homespun would be sought for in vain. Yet the struggle between the loom of the manufacturing trust and the old dame's spinning wheel was, later ally, for the latter, a fight to the death. For, in that case, the livelihood of the operator was at stake. Her time was worth absolutely nothing, except at the wheel. She must needs work for any wage, on it depended her bread. A vast domestic, industrial readjustment was involved, one implying untold human suffering. The result was, however, never for an instant in doubt. The trust of that day was left in undisputed control of the field, and it always must, and always will be, just so long as it supplies purchasers with a better article, at a lower price than they had to pay before. The process does not vary, the only difference is that each succeeding readjustment is on a larger scale, and more far-reaching in its effects. Such, stripped of its verbiage and appeals to sympathy, is the trust proposition. But the popular apprehension always has been, as it now is, that this supply of the better article at a lower price will continue only until the producer, the monopolist, has secured a complete mastery of the situation. Capital, it is argued, is selfish and greedy, corporations are proverbially soulless and insatiable, and, as soon as competition is eliminated, nature will assert itself. Prices will then be raised so as to assure inordinate gains, and when, in consequence of such profits, fresh competitors enter the field, they will either be crushed out of existence by a temporary reduction in price, or absorbed in the trust. All this has a plausible sound, and of it, as a theory of practical outcome, the politician can be re-lied upon to make the most. On this head, however, what has the historical investigator to say? His will be the last word in the debate also, his, the verdict which will be final. The lessons bearing on this contention to be drawn from the record cover a wide field of both time and space. They also silence discussion. They tend indisputably to show that the dangers depicted are imaginary. The subject must, of course, be approached in an unprejudiced spirit, and studied in a large, comprehensive way. Permanent tendencies are to be dealt with, and exceptional cases must be instanced, classified and allowed for. Attempts, more or less successful, at extortion, in a confidence of mastery, can unquestionably be pointed out, but, in the history of economical development, it is no less unquestionable that, on the large scale and in the long run, every new concentration has been followed by a permanent reduction of price in the commodity affected thereby. The world's needs are continually supplied at a lower cost to the world. Again, the larger the concentration, the cheaper the product, until now a new truth of the marketplace has become established and obtained general acceptance, a truth of the most far-reaching consequence, the truth that the largest returns are found in quick sales at small profits. To manage successfully one of those great and complex industrial combinations calls for exceptional administrative capacity in individuals, for men of quick perception, and masterful tempers. These men must be able correctly to read the lessons of experience, and, accepting the facts of the situation, 
they must find out how most exactly to adapt themselves to those facts. No theorist, be he politician or philosopher, appreciates so clearly as does the successful trust executive the fundamental laws of being of the interests he has in charge. Such have good cause to know that, under conditions now prevailing, competition is the sure corollary of the attempted abuse of control, and, moreover, that the largest ultimate returns on capital, as well as the only real security from competition, are found, not in the disposal of a small product at a large profit, but in a large output at prices W.R. Hick encourage consumption. Throwing exceptional cases and temporary conditions out of consideration, as not affecting final results, the historical investigator will probably on this subject find himself much at variance with the political canvasser. That the last will get worsted in the argument hardly need be said. Does history furnish any instance of a financial, an industrial, or a commercial enterprise, a bank, a factory, or an importing company, ever having been powerful enough long to regulate the price of any commodity regardless of competition, except when acting in harmony with and supported by governmental power? Is not the monopolist practically impotent, unless he has the constable at his call? To answer this question absolutely would be to deduce a law of the first importance from the general experience of mankind. So doing would call for a far more careful examination than is now in my power to make, were it even within the scope of my ability, but, if my supposition prove correct, the corollary to be drawn therefrom is to us as a body politic, and at just this juncture, one of the first and most far-reaching import. In such case, the modern American trust. Also, so far as it enjoys any power as a monopoly, or admits of abuse as such, must depend for that power, and the opportunity of abuse, solely on governmental support and cooperation. Its citadel is then the Custom House. The moment the aid of the United States Revenue Officer is withheld, the American monopolist would cease to monopolize except in so far as he could defy competition by always supplying a better article at a price lower than any other producer in the whole world. And here, having deduced and formulated this law, the purely historical investigator would find himself trenching on the province of the economist. The so-called protective system would now be in question. Thus again, as so often before, the tariff would become the paramount issue. But the tariff would no longer stand in the popular mind as the beneficent protector of domestic enterprise, it would on the contrary be the closely associated with the idea of monopoly, it would be assailed as the stronghold of the trust. From the historical and economical point of view, however, the debate would not because of that undergo any diminution of interest. Whatever the politician might in the course of that debate assert, or the opportunist incorporate into legislation, we may rest assured that this issue will ultimately settle itself in accordance with those assistable underlying influences which result in what we know as natural evolution. History is but the record of the adjustment of mankind in the past to the outcome of those influences, and, in this respect, when all is said and done, it is tolerably safe to predict that the future will present no features of novelty. If, then, we can measure correctly the nature of the in fluences at work, the character, as well as the extent, of the impending readjustment may be surmised. For such a diagnosis the historian and economist must furnish the data. It remains to pass on to the third and last of the matters in debate during 1900, that known as imperialism. This was the really great issue before the American people then, and, I submit, it is the really great issue before them now. That issue, moreover, I with confidence submit, can be intelligently considered only from the historical standpoint. Indeed, unless approached through the avenues of human experience, it is not even at once apparent how the question, as it now confronts us, arose, and injected itself into our political action, and, accordingly, it is in some quarters even currently assumed that it is there only fortuitously, a feature in the great chapter of accidents, a passing incident, which may well disappear as mysteriously and as suddenly as it came.
Studied historically, I do not think this view of the situation will bear examination. On the contrary, I fancy even the most superficial investigator, if actuated in his inquiry by the true historical spirit, would soon reach the conclusion that the issue so recently forced upon us had been long in preparation, was logical and inevitable, and, for our good or our evil, must be decided, rightly or wrongly, on a large view of great and complex conditions. In other words, there may be reason to conclude that an inscrutable law of nature, at last involving us, has long been, and now is, evolving results. It is one more phase of natural evolution, working itself out, as in the case of Rome 25 centuries ago, through the survival and supremacy of the fittest. I need hardly say, I feel myself now venturing on a dangerous generalization, and yet I do not see how the American investigator, who endeavors to draw his conclusions from history, can recoil from the venture. His deductions will probably be erroneous, indeed, they are sure to be so to some extent, and, in making them, he is more than likely to make a not inconsiderable display of superficial knowledge. Nonetheless, even if it be of small value, he is bound to offer what he has. If the seed that so sows bears no fruit, it can do small harm. Mr. Leslie Stephen, in one of his essays, truly enough says, the Catholic and the Protestant, the conservative and the radical, the individualist and the socialist, have equal facility in proving their own doctrines with arguments, which habitually begin, for all history shows, Printers should be instructed always to strike out that phrase as an erratum, and to substitute, I choose to take for granted. And elsewhere the same writer lays it down as a general proposition that arguments beginning all his Tory shows are always sophistical. One what is by some known as the doctrine of manifest destiny is, I take it, identical with what others, more piously minded, refer to as the will, or call, of God. The Mohammedan and the modern Christian gospelman Ger say, You God clearly calls us to this or that work, and with a conscience perfectly clear, they then proceed to rob, oppress and slay. In like manner, the political buccaneer and land pirate proclaims that the possession of his neighbor's territory is rightfully his. By manifest destiny. The philosophical politician next drugs the conscience of his fellow men by declaring solemnly that all history shows that might is right, and with time, the court of last appeal, it must be admitted possession is nine points in the law's ten. It cannot be denied, also, that quite as many crimes have been perpetrated in the name of God and of manifest destiny as in that of liberty, and that, at least, all history shows, but, all the same. Just as liberty is a good and desirable thing, so God does live, and there is something in manifest destiny. As applied to the development of the races inhabiting the earth, it is, I take it, merely an unscientific form of speech, the word now in vogue is evolution, the phrase survival of the fittest. When all is said and done, that unreasoning instinct of a people which carries it forward in spite of and over theories to its manifest destiny, Amid the despairing outcries and long-drawn protestations of theorists and ethical philosophers, is a very considerable factor in making his Tory, and, consequently, one to be reckoned with. In plain words, then, and Mr. Stephen to the contrary notwithstanding, all history shows that every great, aggressive and masterful race tends at times irresistibly towards the practical assertion of its supremacy usually at the cost of those not so well adapted to existing conditions. In his great work, Mumsen formulates the law with a brutal directness distinctly Germanic. By virtue of the law, that a people which has grown into a state absorbs its neighbors who are in political knowledge, and a civilized people absorbs its neighbors who are in intellectual knowledge. By virtue of this law, which is as universally valid, and as much a law of nature as the law of gravity, the Italian nation, the only one in antiquity which was able to combine a superior political development and a superior civilization, though it presented the latter only in an imperfect and external manner, was entitled to reduce to subjection the Greek states of the East which were ripe for destruction, 
and to dispossess the peoples of lower grades of culture in the West, Libyans, Iberians, Celts, Germans, by means of its settlers, just as England, with equal right, has in Asia reduced to subjection a civilization of rival standing, but politically impotent, and in America and Australia has marked and ennobled, and still continues to mark and ennoble, extensive barbarian countries with the impress of its nationality. One Professor von Hoistigen states a corollary from the law thus laid down in terms scarcely less explicit, in connection with a well-known and much discussed act of foreign spoliation in our own comparatively recent history. It is as easy to bid a ball that has flown from the mouth of the gun to stop in its flight, and return on its path, as to terminate a successful war of conquest by a voluntary surrender of all conquests because it has been found out that the spoil will be a source of dissension at home. Two and then von Hoist quotes a very significant as well as philosophical utterance of William H. Seward's, which a portion of our earnest Protestants of today would do well to ponder. I abhor war, as I detest slavery. I would not give one human life for all the continent that remains to be annexed. But I cannot exclude the conviction that the popular passion, for territorial aggrandizement is irresistible. Prudence, justice, cowardice, may check it for a season, but it will gain strength by its subjugation. It behooves us then to qualify ourselves for our mission. We must dare our destiny. L1 more, and I have done with quotations. The last I just now commended to the thoughtful consideration of those classified in the political nomenclature of the day as anti imperialists a most conscientious and high-minded class, possessed with the full courage of their convictions, the efforts of the anti-imperialists will not fail, we and they may rest assured, to make themselves felt as they enter into the grand result. Nevertheless, for them also there is food for thought, perhaps for consolation, in this other general law, laid down in 1862 by Richard Cobden, than whose, in my judgment, the utterances of no English-speaking man in the 19th century were more replete with shrewd sense expressed in plain, terse English, from the moment the first shot is fired, or the first blow is struck, in a dispute, then farewell to all reason and argument, you might as well attempt to reason with mad dogs as with men when they have begun to spill each other's blood in mortal combat. I was so convinced of the fact during the Crimean War, which, you know, I opposed, I was so convinced of the utter uselessness of raising one's voice in opposition to war when it has once begun, that I made up my mind that as long as I was in political life, should a war again break out between England and a great power, I would never open my mouth upon the subject from the time the first gun was fired until the peace was made, because, one works, Volume 3. p. 409. When a war is once commenced, it will only be by the exhaustion of one party that a termination will be arrived at. If you look back at our history, what did eloquence, in the persons of Chatham or Burke, do to prevent a war with our first American colonies? What did eloquence, in the persons of Fox and his friends, do to prevent the French Revolution, or bring it to a close? And there was a man who, at the commencement of the Crimean War, in terms of eloquence, in power, and pathos, and argument equal, in terms, I believe, fit to compare with anything that fell from the lips of Chatham and Burke, I mean your distinguished townsman, my friend Mr. Bright, and what was his success? Why, they burnt Ijim in effigy for his pains. L. Turning from the authorities, and the lessons by them deduced from the record called history. Let us now consider the problem precipitated on the American people by the Spanish War of 1898. There has of late been much talk of the sudden development of the United States as a world power, and of the new and prominent part it henceforth has to play, talk, as I hold it, empty, idle and wearisome, closely bordering on Kant. The United States without action is a world power, but, that it has been such a power hard upon a century. I hold not more open to denial. The United States became a world power in the eyes of all nations between five minutes after six o'clock p.m. of the 19th of August, 
1812, and the following half hour, the frigate Constitution, within those 25 minutes, having by her broadsides put the frigate Guerrier in such a position that the one speeches, volume 2. p. 314. British flag had to come down. Since the hands of the Constitution's chronometer marked the half hour after six o'clock of that eventful afternoon, there has been, I hold, no room for debate as to the United States as a world power. For more than eighty years afterwards, the efforts of that power at supremacy were, in obedience to the law of its being and subject to the conditions of its environment, confined to filling up the waste spaces in its immediate neighborhood or to aggressive attitude sometimes resulting in action, towards the less well adapted who chanced to find themselves in its path. But, as the world's solidarity increased, and trade and intercourse, assuming new forms, forced their way into fresh fields, it became inevitable, as the prescriptive barriers, one by one, gave way, that a new and larger policy would evolve itself for the United States also. That policy, moreover, would not fail to find expression soon or late in some assertion of supremacy. It was only a question of place, time and degree. We all know how it came about. It is needless for me here and now to refer in detail to the war with Spain, and the fight in Manila Bay. Suffice it to say that, if human experience goes for anything in such cases, what has since resulted was in its larger scope inevitable, in the nature of a logical outcome, nor in thus stating a conclusion do I imply a spirit of fatalism, or say anything calculated to disparage opposition at the beginning, or discourage discussion now. On the contrary, all history shows, and this time, I submit, shows indisputably and conclusively, that final results are the outcome, not of some of the antecedent influences, or even of those among them most preponderating, but of all of them combined and forever interacting. Every ingredient goes into the grand total, the making its presence felt. This being premised, it must next be admitted that there are few things which, when they first confront perplexed mankind, call more emphatically for challenge than the apparitions of manifest destiny. Such invariably come in questionable shapes. As our own experience teaches, as all history shows, not one time in ten that manifest destiny is heralded does the thing so confidently pronounced as destined come to pass. How many times within our own memoirs it has been appealed to, and in behalf of what causes, ostend manifestos, Fenian raids, servile insurrections, Naboth's vineyard, miscegenation, and the like, the record indicates. It cannot, therefore, and should not even for an instant be assumed that the appeal to God's will, or manifest destiny, is entitled to consideration until it has so proved itself by actually overcoming the most strenuous opposition. That puts its reality to the test. Nor, when, in the matter of so-called expansion, the given manifestation has in the outcome proved itself genuine, and remains an established fact, as, citing our own experience, in the cases of Texas, California, Alaska, Puerto Rico and Hawaii, a condition, and no longer a theory, not then even is the struggle necessarily over. The details remain to be settled, and the details, including all questions of form, involve the whole final character of the development. It is then to be decided whether the inevitable is to assume shape in harmony with our traditions, or in defiance of them. This is the final outcome of conflicting views and opposing forces. In the case now under discussion, therefore, while the Battle of Manila Bay and the Treaty of Paris did, as is now apparent, settle the main issue, and finally committed the United States to a new phase and sphere of expansion, a peopled, trans-Pacific acquisition, to that expansion a shape was, and is yet to be given. It was in debate during the last presidential canvas, it is in debate now. That question, the burning political issue of the hour, I propose here and now to discuss. I propose to discuss it, however, from the purely historical standpoint, and not at all in its moral or economical aspects. So far, then, 
As this question is concerned, the last presidential vote, that of 1900, settled nothing, except that the policy which had assumed a certain degree of form in the Treaty of Paris should not be reversed. All else was left for debate and ulterior settlement. Certain lessons, calculated greatly to influence the character of that settlement, can, I submit, now be most advantageously drawn from history. At formulating those lessons, I propose here to try my hand. The first and most important lesson is one which, in theory at least, is undisputed, though to live up to it practically calls for a courage of conviction not yet in evidence. That a dependency is not merely a possession, but a trust, a trust for the future, for itself and for humanity, is accepted, accordingly it is in no wise to be exploited for the general benefit of the alien owner, or that of individual components of that owner, but it is to be dealt with in a large and altruistic spirit, with an unselfish view to its own utmost development, materially, morally, and politi. Corley. And, through a process of negatives, all his Tory shows that only when this course is hereafter wisely and consecutively pursued, should that blessed consummation ever be attained, will the dominating power itself derive the largest and truest benefit from its possession. As yet no American of any character, much less of authority, has come forward to controvert this proposition. That it will be controverted and attempts made by interested parties to sophisticate it away through the cunningly arranged display of exceptional circumstances, can with safety be predicted? In this respect, to use a cant phrase, we know how it is ourselves. We all remember, for instance, the unspeakable code of factitious morals and deceptive philosophy manufactured to order in these United States as a gospel of niggardom less than half a century ago. Coming down to more recent times, we can, none of us, yet have forgotten the wretched sophistry ignorantly resurrected from French Revolution and a signat days in glorification of fiat money, and a business world emancipated at last from any heretofore accepted measures of value. The leopard, rest assured, has not changed its spots since either 1860 or 1876. The new gospel phase of the debate now on is, however, yet to develop itself. But, assuming the correctness of the proposition I have just formulated, a corollary follows from it. A formidable proposition, I state it without limitations, meaning to challenge contradiction. I submit that there is not an instance in all recorded history, from the earliest precedent to that now making, where a so-called inferior race or community has been elevated in its character, or made self-sustaining and self-governing, or even put a one-one the way to that result, through a condition of dependency or tutelage. I say inferior race, but, I fancy, I might state the proposition even more broadly. I might, without much danger, assert that the condition of dependency, even for communities of the same race and blood, always exercises an emasculating and deteriorating influence. I would undertake, if called upon, to show also that the rule is invariable, that, from the inherent and fundamental conditions of human nature it has known, and can know, no exceptions. Of this history affords well nigh innumerable examples, ourselves among them. In our case, it required a century to do away in our minds and hearts with our colonial traditions. The Civil War, and not what we call the Revolution was our real war of independence. And yet in our dependency days you will remember we were not emasculated into a resigned and even cheerful self-incapacity as the natural result of a kindly, paternal and protective policy, but, as Burke, with profound insight, expressed it, with us the spirit of independence and self-support was fostered through a wise and salutary neglect. But, for present purposes, all this is unnecessary and could lead but to a poor display of commonplace learning. The problem today engaging the attention of the American people is more limited. It relates solely to what are called inferior races, those of the same race, or of cognate races, we as yet do not propose to hold in a condition of permanent dependency, those we absorb, or assimilate. Only those of inferior race, the less developed or decadent, 
do we propose to hold in subjection, dealing with them, in theory at least, as a guardian deals with a family of wards? My proposition then broadens. If history teaches anything in this regard, it is that race elevation, the capacity in a word of political self support, cannot be imparted through tutelage. Moreover, the milder, the more paternal, kindly and protective the guardianship, the more emasculating it will prove. A wise and salutary neglect is in the end the more benefice and policy, for, with races as with individuals, a state of dependency breeds the spirit of dependency. Take Great Britain, for instance. That people, working at it now consecutively through three whole centuries, after well nigh innumerable experiences and as many costly blunders, Great Britain has, I say, developed a genius for dealing with dependencies, for the government of inferior races, a genius far in advance of anything the world has seen before. Yet my contention is that, today, after three rounded centuries of British rule, the Hindustanis, comma the natives of India, in spite of all material, industrial and educational improvements, roads, schools, justice and peace, are in 1900 less capable of independent and ordered self-government than they were in the year 1600, the year when the East India Company was incorporated under a patent of Elizabeth. The native Indian dynasties, those natural to the Hindus, have disappeared, accustomed to foreign rule, the people have no rulers of their own, nor could they rule themselves. The rule of aliens has with Hindustan thus become a domestic necessity. Remove it, and the highest and most recent authoritized declare it surely will some day be removed. Chaos would inevitably ensue. What is true of India, is true of Egypt. That, under British rule, Egypt is today in better material and political case than ever before in its history, modern, biblical, hieroglyphic or legendary, scarcely admits of dispute. Schools, roads, irrigation, law and order, and protection from attack, she has them all. But what avail the plough or sail, or land or life, if freedom fail? The capacity for self-government is not acquired in that school. This fact is today more than ever before forcing itself on the attention and engaging the insection as thought of those Englishmen most familiar with the imperial system. As yet there is no sign that the British are accomplishing, in Hindostai, more than the Romans accomplished in Britain, that they will spread any permanently successful ideas, or that they will found anything whatever. It is still true that if they departed, or were driven out, they would leave behind them, as the Romans did in Britain, splendid roads, many useless buildings, an increased weakness in the subject people, and a memory which in a century of new events would be extinct. So far as one can see, not a European idea, not a European habit, not a distinctively European branch of knowledge, ever penetrated into Asia. We are told every day how Europe has influenced Japan, and forget that the change in those islands was entirely self-generated, that Europeans did not teach Japan, but that Japan of herself chose to learn from Europe methods of organization, civil and military, which have so far proved successful. L. Such is the recent testimony of one closely observing Englishman, the larger portion of whose life has been passed in Asia. Another says, to the same effect, the very peace and security which a great empire establishes may prove a deadening influence. In India peace reigns today, and order, but there is certainly less scope for the eastern patriotism of race and class, less romance and food for poetry, less motive for heroic self-sacrifice, less to stir the heart and imagination of Rajput and Sikh, of Maratu and Parthen, than there was in those years of glorious turbulence in the breaking up of the Mughal Empire. British rule tends to destroy native originality, vigor and initiative. How to replace that which our rule takes away is the great Indian problem. L evidence on this head might be accumulated to any desired extent, and yet today a vague idea, almost an aspiration, is floating through our American popular mind that a single generation of our beneficent rule will suffice to convert Malays into self-governing communities of the Anglo-Saxon type. 
But England, in its own 2000 years of his Tory, furnishes an example of what I have been asserting, an example well nigh forgotten. In fundamentals human nature is much the same now as 20 centuries back. During the first century of the present era, the Romans, acting in obedience to the law laid down by Momsen, the law quoted by me in full, and of which Thomas Carlyle is the latest and most eloquent exponent, the law known as the divine right of the most masterful, acting in obedience to that law, the Romans in the year of grace. 43 crossed the British Channel, overthrew the Celts and Gauls gathered in defense of what they mistakenly deemed their own, and, after reducing them to subjection, permanently occupied the land. They remained the four centuries, a hundred years longer than the English have been in Calcutta. During that period they introduced civilization, established Christianity, constructed roads, dwellings and fortifications. Materially, the condition of the country vastly improved. The Romans protected the inhabitants against their enemies, also against themselves. During four hundred years they benevolently assimilated them. Doubtless, on the banks of the Tiber, the inhabitants of what is now England were deemed incapable of self-government. Probably they were, unquestionably they became so. When the legions were at last withdrawn, the results of a kindly paternalism, secure protection and intelligent tutelage became apparent. The race was wholly emasculate. It cursed its independence, it deplored its lost dependency. As the English historian now records the result, crushing all local independence, crushed all local vigor. Men forgot how to fight for their country when they forgot how to govern it. There is a familiar saying to the effect that, while man is always in a hurry, God never is. Certainly, nature works with a discouraging indifference to time. Each passing generation of reformers does love to witness some results of its efforts, but, in the case of England, in consequence of the emasculation incident to tutelage, and dependency on a powerful, a benevolent and beneficent foreign rule, after that rule ended, as soon or late such rule always must end. Throughout the lives of eighteen successive generations emasculated England was overrun. At last, with some half dozen intermediate rulers, the Normans succeeded the Romans. They were conquering masters, but they domesticated themselves in the British Islands, and in time assimilated the inhabitants thereof, Britons, Picts and Celts, benevolently, or otherwise. But, as nearly as the historian can fix it, it required eight centuries of direst tribulation to educate the people of England out of that spirit of self-distrust and dependency into which they had been reduced by four centuries of paternalism, at once Roman and temporarily beneficent. Twelve centuries is certainly a discouraging term to which to look forward. But steam and electricity have since then been developed to a manifest quickening of results. Even the pace of nature was in the 19th century vastly accelerated. Briefly stated, then, the historical deduction would seem to be somewhat as follows, where a race has in itself, whether implanted the by nature or as the result of education, the elevating instinct and energy, the capacity of mastership, a state of dependency will tend to educate that capacity out of existence, and the more beneficent, paternal and protecting the guardian power is, the more pernicious its influence becomes. In such cases, the course most beneficial in the end to the dependency, now as a century ago, would be that characterized by a wise and salutary neglect. Where, however, a race is for any cause not possessed of the self innate saving capacity. Being stationary or decadent, a state of depend. In C, while it may improve material conditions, tends yet further to deteriorate the spirit and to diminish the capacity of self-government, if severe, it brutalizes, if kindly, it enervates. History records no instance in which it develops and strengthens. Following yet further the teachings of experience, we are thus brought to a parting of the ways, a parting distinct, unmistakable. Heretofore the policy of the United States, as a nationality, has so far as the so-called inferior races are concerned, 
been confined in its operation to the North American continent, but, as a whole and in its large aspects, it has been well defined and consistent. We have proceeded on the theory that all government should in the end rest on the consent of the governed, that any given people is competent to govern itself in some fashion, and that, in the long run, any fashion of self-imposed government works better results than will probably be worked by a government imposed from without. In other words, the American theory has been that, in the process of nature in looking to ultimate, perhaps remote, conditions, any given people, not admitting of assimilation, will best work out its destiny when left free to work it out in its own way. Moreover, so far as outside influence is concerned, it could, in the grand result, be more effectively exercised through example than by means of active intervention where we have not therefore forcibly absorbed into our system foreign and inferior races alien in character and more or less completely assimilated them, we have, up to very recently, adopted and applied what may perhaps in homely speech best be described as a hands-off and walk-alone doctrine. Relying in our policy toward others on the theory practiced at our private firesides, the theory that self-government results from example, and is self-taught, I have already quoted Richard Cobden in this connection, I will quote him again. Referring, in 1864, to the British foreign policy, then by him as by us denounced, though by us now imitated, Cobden said, I maintain that a man is best doing his duty at home in striving to extend the sphere of liberty, commercial, literary, political, religious, and in all directions, for if he is working for liberty at home, he is working for the advancement of the principles of liberty all over the world. Mexico and Haiti afford striking illustrations of a long and rigid adherence to this policy on our part, and of the results of that adherence. Conquering and dismembering Mexico in 1847, we, in 1848, left it to its own devices. So completely had the work of subjugation been done that our representatives had actually to call in to being a Mexican government with which to arrange terms of peace. With that similar crumb of a national authority we made a solemn treaty, and, after so doing, left the Aztec land to work out its destiny, if it could, as it could. Too in spite of numerous domestic convulsions and much internal anarchy, from that day to this we have neither ourselves intervened in the internal affairs of our southern continental neighbor, nor long permitted such interference by others. To Mexico, we have said, walk alone. To France, hands off. The result we all know. It has gone far to justify our theory of the true path of human advancement. Forty years is, in matters of race development, a short time a period much too short to admit of drawing positive, or final, inferences. Dr. Holmes was once asked by an anxious mother when the education of a child should begin, his prompt, if perhaps unexpected, reply was, not less than 250 years before it is born. Today, and under existing conditions, Mexico, though republican in name and form only, is self-governing in reality. It is manifestly working its problem out in its own way. The statement carries with it implications hardly consistent with the might is right, latter day dispensation voiced by Momsen and Carlyle. Haiti presents another case in point, with results far more trying to our theory. We have toward Haiti pursued exactly the policy pursued by us with Mexico. Not interfering ourselves in the internal affairs of the island we have not permitted interference by others. Occupied by an inferior race, apparently lapsing steadily toward barbarism, for the condition of affairs prevailing in Haiti the United States is morally responsible. Acting on the law laid down in the extract I had given from the pages of Momsen, we might at any time during the last quarter of a century have intervened in the name of humanity and to the great temporary advantage of the inhabitants of the one region where black rules white. The United States, in pursuance of its theories, has abstained from so doing. It has abstained in the belief that, in the long run and grand result, the inhabit. Ants of Haiti will best work out their problem, if left to work it out themselves. 
In any event, however, exceptional cases are the rocks on which sound principles come to wreck, and, so far as the race of man on earth is concerned, it is better that Haiti should suffer self-caused misfortune for centuries, as did England before, than that a precedent should be created for the frequent violation of a great principle of natural development. Yet the case of Haiti is crucial. Persistently to apply our policy there evinces, it must be admitted, a robust faith in the wisdom of its universal application. The logical inference, so far as the Philippine Islands are concerned, is obvious. The rule guiding, or that should guide, the United States in its dealings with alien races, probably inferior, as being either as yet undeveloped or else in a state of arrested development, is simple. The capacity for self government, and, consequently, the consent of the governed, should be assumed, until, as the result of experience, a negative is proved, the interference should then be the least necessary to arrest decay or secure stability. The assumption should ever be in favor of a tendency to progressive self-development. The British rule is the reverse. Incapacity is assumed, until capacity is proved. Historically speaking, those now referred to are the only two theories of a national policy to be pursued in dealing with practical dependencies, which challenge consideration, the American and the British. The others, whether ancient and abandoned, or modern and in use. Phoenician, Roman, Spanish, French, Dutch, German, or Russian, may be dismissed from the discussion. They none of them ever did, nor do. Any of them now, look to an altruistic result. In all, the dependency is confessedly exploited on business principles, with an eye to the trade development of the alien proprietor. Setting these aside, there remain only the American or walk alone and hands on zero theory, and the British, or war did chance three theory. The first is exemplified in Mexico and Haiti, the last in Hindostan and Egypt. The question now in debate for the United States may, therefore, be concisely stated, thus, taking the Philippine Islands as a subject for treatment, and the ultimate elevation of the inhabitants of those islands to self-government as the end in view which is the policy best calculated to lead to the results desired. The traditional and distinctively American system, as exemplified in the cases of Mexico and Haiti, or the modern and improved British system, to be studied in Hindostan and Egypt. Subject to imitations of time and space I have now passed in review the great political debates which have occupied the attention of the American public during the last half century. I have endeavored to call attention to the plane on which those debates have been conducted, and to the noticeable absence from them of a scholarly spirit. The judicial temper and the patience necessary to any thorough investigation have in them, I submit, been conspicuously lacking. Then, starting from the point of view peculiar to this association, I have examined their issues presented to the country in the last presidential canvas, and, for purposes of illustration, I have discussed them, always in a purely historical temper. While the result of my experiment is for others to pass upon, my own judgment is clear and decided. I hold that the time has now come when organizations such as this of ours, instead of, as heretofore, scrupulously standing aloof from the political debate, are under obligation to participate in it. As citizens, we most assuredly should insofar as we may properly so do, contribute to results, whether immediate, or more or less remote. As scholars and students, the conclusions we have to present should be deserving of thoughtful consideration. The historical point of view, moreover, is, politically, an important point of view, for only when approached historically, by one looking before, as well as after, can any issue be understood in its manifold relations with a complex civilization? Indeed, the moral point of view can in its importance alone compare with the historical. The economical, vital as it unquestionably often is, comes much lower in the scale, for, while an approach through both these avenues is not infrequently necessary to the intelligent comprehension of questions of a certain class, such, for instance, as the tariff or currency, it is very noticeable that, 
though many issues present themselves, slavery or imperialism, for example, into which economical considerations do not enter as controlling factors, there is scarcely any matter of political debate which does not to some extent at least have to be discussed historically. Still, though our retrospect has proven this to be the case, the scarcely less significant fact also appears that not more than one presidential canvas in two involves any real issue at all, moral or economical. Of the last twelve elections, covering the half century, six were mere struggles for political control, and so far as can now be seen, the course of subsequent events would have been in no material respect other than it was, whichever party prevailed. Judging by experience, Therefore, in only one future canvas out of two will any occasion arise for a careful historical presentation of facts. The investigator will not be called upon, and, if he rises to take part in the discussion, he will do no harm, for the excellent reason that no one will listen to him. In the other of each two canvases it is not so. There is then apt to be a real debate over a paramount issue, and, in all such, the strong searchlight of experience should be thrown, clearly and fully, over the road we are called upon to traverse. In every such case, the presentation, provided always it be made in the true historical spirit, should by no means be of one side only. On the contrary, every phase of the record should have its advocate, every plausible lesson should be drawn. The facts are many, complicated and open to a varied construction and it is only through the clash of opposing views that they can be reduced to comparative system, and compelled to yield their lessons for guidance. As I have also, more than once already, observed, this association is largely made up of those occupying the chairs of instruction in our seminaries of the higher education. From their lecture rooms the discussion of current political issues is of necessity excluded. There it is manifestly out of place. Others here are scholars, for whom no place exists on the political platform. Still others are historical investigators and writers, interested only incidentally in political discussion. Finally, some are merely public. Spirited citizens, on whom the oratory of the stump palls. They crave discussion of another order. They are the men whose faces are seen only at those gatherings which someone eminent for thought or in char actor is invited to address. To all these, the suggestion I now make cannot but be grateful. It is that, in future, this association, as such, shall so arrange its meetings that one at least shall be held in the month of July preceding each presidential election. The issues of that election will then have been presented, and the opposing candidates named. It should be understood that the meeting is held for the purpose of discussing those issues from the historical point of view and in their historical connection. Absolute freedom of debate should be insisted on, and the participation of those best qualified to deal with the particular class of problems under discussion should be solicited. Such authorities, speaking from so lofty a rostrum to a select audience of appreciative men and women, could, I confidently submit, hardly fail to elevate the standard of discussion bringing the calm lessons of history to bear on the angry wrangles and distorted presentations of those whose chief, if not only, aim is a mere party supremacy. I am to contribute to this occasion a paper under the title of a plea for military history. To this subject I have already, more than six months ago, elsewhere alluded, in the course of an address to the Massachusetts Historical Society, on taking for the fifth time the chair as its president. It is scarcely an exaggeration to say that there are not many considerable branches of human knowledge concerning which the historian of the future must not in some degree inform himself. Somewhere and somehow his researches will touch upon them, remotely, perhaps, but still as factors in his problem. Formerly all necessary information, it was supposed, could be acquired from books, manuscripts were better yet, for those were, without any question, what are termed original sources. But the old fashioned historian, rarely, if ever, hesitating, flies boldly at every kind of game, all are fish that come to his net. For instance, history is largely made up of accounts of operations and battles on land and on sea. 
weary of threading his way through a long period of most impicturesque peace, trying to make that interesting.